Pittsburgh right here at the Royals dugout. And we know how much fun this team is. We know how hard they work. And they are absolutely ready to defend their American League crown. We look at a lot of the prognosticators, some of the experts, and there have been a lot of naysayers out there. Services predicting them to finish under 500 and third, fourth place, some of them, when you look at it. But the Royals, hey, they are ready to answer the critics. Eric Hosmer of the naysayers saying, that's the outside world looking in. We proved people wrong last year. We'll do it again. Alex Gordon says, doesn't feel like we have a target on our back. People aren't talking about us a whole lot. And Lorenzo Cain, we're being overlooked. And that is just fine with us as Cain walked by me right now and said, all day. The guys are fired up and having a good time down here. We know how hard they work. And they are extremely loose. And ready to get going here. What's in up, bud? And there's Jeremy Guthrie. I'm sure we'll be hearing from him and many more coming up in the broadcast. Brian? All right, Joel. Looking forward to that. As we look at the Chicago White Sox lineup for tonight. Adam Eaton, their center fielder. They just signed him to a five-year contract extension. The former Royal, Melky Cabrera, will bat second and play in left field. And we'll keep an eye on Avisail Garcia in right. He's a big key for the White Sox coming off of shoulder surgery as they try and bounce back from 73 wins and they will face Jason Vargas 11 wins last year but maybe none bigger than winning game four of the American League Championship Series and sending the Royals to the World Series that's right Vargas he's the veteran on the staff him and Guthrie he's had a little bit of a rough spring but you know a lot of veterans will tell you that spring training is a time to get your pitches right and try to stay out of the middle of the plate now that's what Dave Island wants to see tonight he, Dave told me before the game, keep the, the fastball above the belt and away from those right-handed hitters and keep the breaking balls down and stay out of the middle. That's the big key for him. Well, the Royals maybe didn't have the best fielding percentage in baseball last year, but most would agree they had the best defense in the major leagues last year. And Ned Yost has everyone out there tonight as far as regulars. Minus Salvador Perez. The Royals led Major League Baseball with 93 defensive runs saved. Unbelievable how these guys can patrol that pasture out there in the outfield. Now, the addition of Rios, just fine. They're happy. Now, this guy's a good athlete. He's very fluid. He runs fast. Takes nice routes to the ball. So far, so good. And we just saw that Rios and Lorenzo Kane in the waning sunlight, they're going to have their hands full. Rios... As the cap pulled down, the sunglasses on, glove out in front of his eyes, doing everything he can to keep the sun out of his eyes, and Lorenzo Kane doing the same thing. And you know the glasses they work for the glare, but your your hand, just what they're doing, that's the best defense right there, especially picking it up off the bat. One and two from Vargas to Adam Eaton. 123 games he was on the disabled list twice but when he was healthy he was a spark for the White Sox both offensively and defensively and it's a good sign for Vargas as he puts him away with a breaking ball yeah getting ahead of guys is key for Vargas Dave Island would like to see those secondary pitches like that last one stay down everything he wants to see Vargas pitch tonight is down except for that fastball that he can elevate it above the belt. And now Melky Cabrera. The Royals pursued Melky Cabrera, who eventually signed with Chicago, and that opened the door for Alex Rios. Cabrera had his best year as a major leaguer with the Royals in 2011. Cracked his bat, and Alex hardly has to move for the second out. But back to Vargas. Typically, it's the touch and field finesse pitchers that take the most time to get at the top of their game in spring training, right? Compared to the power guys? No question about it. It's those guys that have the finesse, that have the changeup, like Vargas has that excellent pitch we witnessed last year in his first year in that Royals uniform. He would carve up that dish. But you know, spring training for veteran guys like that, it's a little bit overrated. They'll tell you. However, Dave Island said that Vargas, he expects him to be sharp tonight and keep the ball down out of the zone. He'd like to keep it down to this guy, Jose Abreu. Excellent off speed pitch. Abreu, the unanimous 
American League Rookie of the Year. We showed you his home runs, RBIs, and batting average. Top five in those three categories as a rookie. First time ever. Ooh, yeah, you know, some of the publications I was reading before coming here to camp talked about this guy being one of the top ten best rookie seasons of all time. That's how great a year he had. Pretty impressive. Just missed inside and while we're talking about imposing figures and impact players Bo Jackson who spent five years with the Royals is here and he'll be joining us in the next half inning. He has a connection to both of these organizations coming up to the Royals system coming back making his comeback with the White Sox and then you spent some time with him with the Angels the last year he ever played in Major League Baseball in 1994. It was a, a, a incredible experience to be a teammate of Bo Jackson. Well the change up is there for Vargas at least in the first inning tonight as he gets the White Sox one two three. No score, bottom of the first inning, Royals and White Sox, and we are thrilled to join to our broadcast booth Bo Jackson, who had five memorable seasons with the Royals, and we mentioned also spent some time with the White Sox, and was, and I've heard one of your favorite teammates of all time is sitting to your right. Is that White correct? Sox. Hyperactive. <laughs> Hyperactive. <laughs> Bo, great to see you, man. I see he isn't taking his uh, riddling yet. No, he's, but, 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 he's not but, taking his medicine. Rhino, he really handles me great. He calms me down. Bo, Bo, how are you? I'm tired. My allergies are kicking my butt. Off. I had to stop at the drugstore down the street to get some Zyrtec. Killing me. Uh, did, 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 did people bug you for an autograph when you went in there? No. 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 They don't know you here? They don't know me out here. This is, do you know where you are? Well, yes. Yeah, You're Valley out in the, in the boonies. <laughs> <laughs> you surprise. Know, I left, I actually left Phoenix at the Biltmore at 345. And I just got here about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Man, it is, it's a lot of traffic too there. It's a hump. It's a hump. <laughs> Bo, when you see the game out here, you see your Royals, uh, you know, w w were you happy with the year that they had last year? I was ecstatic. I was happy as a little girl got a brand new bicycle. Oh, man. What impressed you the most? The way they hustled. The, the, the way they hustled, they played as a team. And um, at the beginning of the season, nobody expected them to get to where they were. And these guys just went out and played ball. They went out and played ball. And they spoke with their actions. I spoke with the match. Incredible. See, you know, but, but talking to them now, Bo, they feel like they have un unfinished business. Oh. You know, they, 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 they fell short. And, you know, after that game, when they lost in game seven, mm -hmm. you could have heard a pin drop in that in that clubhouse. Those guys were, they were crushed. Oh. They, were, they thought they were going to win it. They went, they ran off eight straight uh, postseason wins. Never been done in the history of baseball. Rex, when you're at the big dance, 
you expect to dance with a pretty girl. And they made it all the way to the dance floor. They made it there. They made it there. They just didn't play their song that night. The DJ just didn't play their song that night. Right? <laughs> it's that simple. It's just that simple. <laughs> and that's all. But, you know, I really don't think these kids have anything to uh, prove. They just got to play baseball. They actually... They actually put their stamp on the league last year, so the league knows what they're capable of. And they put everybody on, on uh, notice. That boy. And when yeah. you're able to do that, your opponents, they stand up and take notice. Look what the Central did. They all yes. beefed up. Your, your yes. old team, other old team, the White Sox, man, they, they just bombarded their system with all kinds of uh, free agent signings and spent all this money to try to compete with the Royals. I tell you what, I, but I tell you what, everybody in the league is trying to beef up. Everybody okay. in the league trying to beef up. Even in the other league. See, because with me being in Chicago, the only thing I hear is that White Sox and the Cubs. White Sox and the Cubs. White Sox and the Cubs. And the Cubs even beefed up this year. So, so I think everybody is looking to make it to the big dance. And now, what I've seen, I have been in town for for almost a week, and um, just from what I've seen, I've been at the ballpark with, with the uh, White Sox every day, just watching them swing the bat. These kids can hit. These kids can hit. Bray, you impress you at all? All right. It's ridiculous. Bo, no one hit the ball like you did. Listen, no one struck out like I did, too. Because I, cause I either hit it hard or I walked back to the dugout with the bat in two pieces. How about the time you, you busted your bat over your, over your helmet when you walked off? Uh, that was just somebody got me out. Somebody got me out that wasn't supposed to get me out. He fooled me. He we have a, Bo, we have a, a clip of some of your many highlights with the Royals and unforgettable moments in Royals history. I'm, I'm just curious. What ones stand out for you? Which ones do you look back and say, man, that impressed even someone of your stature? The world, the uh, all-star game home run off Rick Russell, the climb in the wall, the home runs in the Deion Sanders rivalry game, the diving plays. Which one stands out for you? I would, I would. Or this throw. <laughs> Actually, this is one of my favorites. Called you Harold. nailed Harry. You got him. <laughs> Watch him. <I> was... <laughs> <laughs> Till this day. Harold is still pissed off at me <laughs> because he said he was supposed to be the hero. He was supposed to score the win and run. That was a win and run there. And I threw him out, and we came back and beat him in the next inning by two. Phenomenal throw. You didn't even take a crow hop. You don't have to. I, I didn't have to. Could you always throw like that? I was a crab apple. Crab apple battle king. Right I broke more windows and threw more crab apples through screen doors because kids got tired of throwing with me, and they run inside. They weren't protected. I threw one right through the door. <laughs> so <laughs> throwing is easy. Throwing has always been easy for me, guys. Okay. You you played in 1994 with one hip. To yes. my knowledge, has that not been any other major league player ever play with a hip replacement? Now, that hip they put in you was a hip that they give senior citizens, too. So it wasn't exactly safe. And we were a little bit nervous about you, you know, breaking your leg or, or that thing, breaking off the way that you ran and the way you would slow down. Were you ever nervous about about that? I never gave it a second thought Because I was doing what I loved doing. Play ball. And, and, and if anything happened, <clears throat> hey, you can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about Can it. you stay another half? Please. I wish I could. No. Come on. Rex, you we, see? We, we haven't listen. even gotten to the questions we want to ask I you. Love, well, that's your business. There's Harry. He's got no chance. Harry, you are out. Look, 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 look. Watch it, watch it. Real.
No score to the second inning. Royals and the Chicago White Sox. The impressive first innings for Jason Vargas, who struck out two. And Carlos Radon, who ended up striking out the side. And uh, Vargas is going to get Connor Gillespie, Avisail Garcia, and Gordon Beckham. And Gillespie is out. That is the first chance, by the way, for Omar Infante on defense. He's been out with a sore elbow. So we have to give HUD an assist here because uh, Bo was on his way out of the booth. He has uh, allergies. commitments with, well, allergies, and you also have commitments with uh, the White Sox who are broadcasting. Yes. But uh, you just couldn't take it, could you? All I the threatened begging and pleading. To beat him in arm, arm wrestling, and he stayed. <laughs> I think right. a lot of people would pay to see that. Riddle it. Riddle it. <laughs> Bo, what's uh, um, you've been very successful in business since your playing career, and I'm sure the fans would love to hear what, what's keeping you busy with with uh, business and family. Well, the thing, well, family always comes first. My baby is getting ready to graduate here in May, so that's money that I can save. That's money that I don't have to spend <laughs> anymore. But uh, as far as business concerned, I got my um, I got my indoor sports complex in Chicago. My, Bo Jackson Elite Sports. Um, what else do I have? Uh, I got my um, I got I got my self management and marketing company out of Mobile that I've had since college. Okay. Uh, just opened. Uh, I got the bank. I got the bank business. But it's your charity work that impresses me. I want to tell you about my charity what work. What you do huh? for others, we all know you it's in you your. Just cut me off we all right know now. it's in your bank account, Bo. Come on, look. Is the, what are you doing for others? What am I doing for others? Yes, we want to hear that. It's wonderful. My, my number one charity is my Bo Jackson's Give Me a Chance Foundation out of Chicago. And what it does, it's, and we have a charity set up to benefit inner, inner city youth, inner city and kids in the burbs for the reason is that you have a lot of kids that's not affiliated with organized sports. And we're getting kids involved in organized sports, preferably baseball. We're teaching them the game of baseball through education. So what that means is that in order for them to be a part of our program, you got to make the grades. If you can't make the grades, you can't come to my sports facility. How about taking care of people from natural disasters, tornadoes, things like that? You're right. I have bike. my Bow Bikes Bama. Actually, that's coming up in a couple of months also out of Alabama. Um, this will be my fourth year doing it. And in the process of over four years since the two, since the uh, tornado in 2011, uh, the Bow Bikes Bama, and with the help from the, from the governor's the disaster relief fund, we, we have built over 100 community tornado shelters throughout mm. the state of Alabama. Oh, fantastic. So they can hold 75 people com comfortably, but they can also hold 150 if you squeeze them in there. Mm. So... And the uh, structures are 100, are they are steel structures, can withstand winds up to over 600 miles an hour. Wow! And our ride this year is I think May 2nd. And it's out of Auburn. We have we have two rides. One's a 68 mile ride, and the next and the short one is is a 20 mile ride. I think you can do the 20 mile ride, huh? Well, oh, 10 mile might be enough. But see, it's, but for, for the people, I'll go. The way I, the way, the way. The way I feel good now is that by doing things for others. And like you say, my two charities that I work with, that's what I most, that's what, that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps the juices flowing. It's un that's outstanding work. Well, you always got to give back. Huh? Always got to give back. And always trying to teach the younger guys, you got to give back. You got to give back. You have so much, you got to give something back. I'm risking asking a question here with two strikes and two outs. We'll keep it another I, half. I, I can't. No, you can't. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> he, was, he had the headsets off. He had his phone and his keys in his pocket, and he was out of the booth. And uh, HUD kept him. So The only reason that I stay is because of HUD. <laughs> but he has worn out his welcome now. <clears throat> He's worn out his welcome. He's a, <laughs> he is a nut. Well, thank you. Thank Appreciate you, guys. It. Bo Jackson. Thank Thanks for spending time with us. Thank you.
A familiar face as far as the Royals go, but maybe a different one at first base. Former Royals outfielder Mitch Meyer has been coaching first base all spring training. And the guy we're used to seeing at first base is this man, Rusty Koontz, still the first base coach, but you've got a an apprentice, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, Skipper said oh, hey. the guy with the two good eyes is going to go out. He's going to be the guy that coaches first base until the guy with one good eye gets fixed, and then I can go back out there again. Well, you we know you love the game. We know you've been doing it a long time, but we know that it's not going to go on forever. At least that's what you say. Hey. And and so Mitch is a guy that you're grooming down the road for the future. What do you, what did you like about Mitch? We've known him a long time. Well, I mean, you know, the one one thing about Mitch is that, you know, he played here. Uh, he played with a lot of the guys that are on the team right now, and they respect the heck out of him. And and if he's going to go forward as a coach or whatever it is, you're going to have that. You're going to have to have that respect of the players. And and you know, it's just a natural fit for him to take over for me because, like you say, I I took. Um, I just turned 60, so I'm not getting any younger around these 20-year-olds, and Mitch is only 30, so he's half my age, so he's going to bring uh, twice the amount of energy that I've got. So he's going to do a great job, and he is doing a great job. Well, there's our first look. I want to ask you about that again in a moment, but our first look here on Fox Sports Kansas City at Kendris Morales. What have you seen from him, the switch hitter, and a nice stroke there? Well, he's a true for professional. I mean, in fact, we had a meeting today, and I told these guys, you, you watch Alex Rios play, and you watch Mo play. I mean, this is how you play the game, and they're in their 30s. So our 20-year-olds are looking around, and it's like, yeah, follow these guys, watch them play every day, and, you know, they're both true professionals. But Mo brings, you know, that switch hitting, and he's got pop from both sides, and that was one of the things that uh, being a switch hitter uh, enables us is to keep him in the lineup and swing from both sides. We just had Bo Jackson up in the booth with HUD and, and with Ryan showing that great throw against Seattle. It, were you perhaps there? I was, I was standing right there in the first base coaching box and Jimmy yeah. Joyce was the first base umpire and Larry Young was behind the plate and it was a 3-2 pitch and Alvin Davis, a dead pole hitter, for whatever reason, hits the ball down the left field line and Harold is running on the pitch so by the time Bo picked the ball up, I think Harold was only two steps away from third base, if not on the bag. And this thing came out of Bo's hand, which is, you know, I mean, it's just legendary now. But actually standing there and watching it, and you could not believe what you were looking at. And sure enough, oh, God, there it is. Okay, ball off the wall. See, look where Harold is. Okay, now Bo just turns and throws an absolute strike to Booney. Got him right on the back heel. Harold thought he was safe. But Larry Young rotated up to third base, and Jimmy Joyce was supposed to be Jimmy Joyce was supposed to be at home plate making that call. Well, Jimmy Joyce is standing next to me at first base because we thought the game was over. And Larry Larry Young had to call him out from uh, third base, and the 5,000 people were in the kingdom booting all. <laughs> the tremendous throw, though. Well, you, you've seen so many memories over the year, and I, I thought it was interesting talking to you the other day, and you love the game and then as much as anyone, but you were saying that that the least favorite part of your day is the game. And that, that doesn't mean that you don't like the game, but explain that. Well, I, 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 I've always enjoyed the teaching part, you know, teaching them how to run the bases, how to steal a base, uh, how to play outfield, you know, situations, backup coverage, all that kind of stuff. That's been my passion, you know, and that's that's a part of it. But, um, but yeah, if, if I had to take the teaching over the game, I'll take the teaching all the time. Now, I said to you the other day, does, does Mitch remind you of a young you? Because a guy that was, was, you know, a good outfielder, had a role on a team, not a superstar, and I thought it was a pretty good comparison, and then and, and you said what? Well, I mean, he's good looking, he's got a great body, looks great in the uniform. I don't know where that comes to play with what I'm doing. But, uh, you know, I mean, a young pair of eyes, you know, a lot of energy, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but you've got the best hair in the big leagues, and, and, and I said to you the other day, that do they not... Say so you're Robert Redford. Well, and then my comment on that, I, I finally Googled Robert Redford. He's like 90 years old, so if I look like that at 60, I don't know where I'm going to go from there. The other thing that I learned the other day from you was that you were known from a, for a phrase. I think some of our fans know it. Every player and everyone in baseball knows it. One word or two words, I guess, that you say over and over again, which is we see that ball up the middle. A good thing that Moose beat that one out so we can continue the story. And as Rossi said, get in there, get in there. Okay. Your phrase is what? Player. Oh, player. How did that start? You call everyone player. Well, 
back when I first started coaching, you know, we get a lot of young players, and most of them come out of high school or, or out of college. So every coach is a coach, you know, and when we get into pro ball, we tell guys, look, we have first names. Mine's Rusty, yours is Joe, this is John, this is Bill. You know, we don't go by coach anymore. We go by our first name. Well, it's hard for a lot of the young guys to get into that, so they keep calling you coach. Well, I finally got tired of listening to the coach, so I told him, okay, you call me coach, I'm going to call you player. I'm not going to call you by your first name. So anyway, so they couldn't get out of it, couldn't get out of it, so everybody became a player, and I didn't think it was going to last for 40 years, but it did, so that's where that came from. And the energy. I mean, you love bringing the energy every day, don't you? Yeah. Well, it, it's hard not to. When you get out of bed, you know you gotta you got to deal with about 40, 20-year-olds, and you, you better take a lot of uh, Advil and whatever it takes you to get up because uh, they do. I mean, and, and especially this team. This is probably the most energetic team I've ever been around this year and last year. Um, and I've been around quite a few, but, yeah, the youth and the energy and, and just y you see them smile on the bench, and they love one another, and they're great teammates for each other, and, and it's a pleasure to come every day and work with them. And they were talking about Bo playing through injuries, and that was, you know, the amazing thing. But, but let, let's go head to toe. What, what are you dealing with right now? Oh, my eye. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, the, the doctor... I don't know. He opened up the right side of my eye, took the lens out, and put a new lens in. And then he did some laser over the top of it. So now, instead of being legally blind in my right eye, I can actually, uh, I'm close to about a 2040. And he said within possibly another week, I'd be okay. And there's also elbow and arm and knee and ankle. But we're heading to a break. So, Rusty, thanks. We're looking forward to a great 2015. You guys will visit with Ned Yost when we come back. Inning. We're in surprise, Royals and the White Sox, and pleased to be joined by Royals manager Ned Yost, sitting just outside the Royals dugout. Ned, first of all, thanks for joining us, and second of all, how would you assess spring training up to this point? It's been great. Um, you know, our focus and energy has been um, the best I've ever seen it. You know, our guys came into spring training, uh, you know, very proud of what they accomplished last year but none of them was satisfied with what we accomplished and um, the work ethic the focus the energy has been uh, off the charts so um, you know they've all got a, a goal in mind of uh, uh, finishing off what uh, we came so close to doing last year and they've worked very hard at trying to uh, get themselves in a position to accomplish it we hear so many times during spring training and I, I guess especially with pitchers that they are just getting their work in in the early outings and Jason Vargas looks sharp tonight and uh, just beginning his third inning. Is this about the point in spring training where there is a change of mindset from getting your work into getting ready for the regular season. Well I think there is you know we always kind of use the off day as a. Uh you know as the line to where we start really getting focused you know generally the off day occurs you'll have uh, you know a week to 
you know, eight or nine days before uh, the season starts. So we uh, generally, you know, focus on getting their work in and uh, start getting your mindset, you know, a little more accustomed to uh, regular season play after the uh, off, after the off off day. But you know, it's hard here in spring training. You know, the schedule's totally different than it is during the regular season. You know, you're playing a majority of night games here. You're playing it's 85 degrees and. You're not playing for anything, and, uh, you know, it's hard for, you know, professional competitors, um, you know, to get geared up to, to, you know, play for nothing. So, uh, you know, once that season starts, that little internal switch that they have inside their bodies that makes them so good clicks on, and you'll see, uh, you know, a pretty big difference uh, once the season starts in terms of their focus and, and their ability to go out and really, uh, you know, execute pitches. But, you know, they're trying right now, but when there's really nothing on the line, it makes it a little more difficult. What have you liked about newcomers Rios and Morales? Well, I like the way they swing the bat. You know, both of them, uh, you know, are proven run producers throughout their career. Uh, Kendris Morales is, uh, you know, was one of the best offensive, you know, players in the game before he broke his leg. And, uh, he, he, you know, had that real tough recovery coming back. And um, last year, you know, didn't have a spring training, didn't have a first half and got thrown right in the mix. We just think with a spring training under his belt, he's going to be back to being Kendrick Morales. And he swung the bat very well all spring for us. Um, Alex Rios was hurt all year last year. And, uh, you know, he's healthy now. So he's been swinging the bat extremely well, too. So I think they're both going to be very, very good additions. Ned, this team is, is truly a team. I think anybody closely associated or even people looking on the outside really comment about how well this team plays together, how, how much they enjoy playing together, how much they want to win together. And while Rios and Morales seem like good fits as far as the numbers go, how much attention did you and Dayton and the rest of the front office pay to how their personalities would mix with this clubhouse? A great deal of attention. Um, you know, the majority of the homework you do is on their makeup. It's not. You can you can tell by stats and by watching them what kind of players they are. So the majority of the work that you do, the majority of the phone calls, the emails, the talking to people is all on their makeup. What kind of person are What are they like in the clubhouse? What do they like when things aren't going well? What are they like when things are going well? Uh, and that's where the homework, uh, you know, is involved, is trying to, you know, make sure that, you know, these guys have the right makeup to fit into this clubhouse. I also want to talk to you about some of the younger players, Ned, in that, you know, there have been spring trainings in years past where there was a lot of focus on the young players because they, they were the hope for the future. And now, now we have a championship team with very few jobs up for grabs in spring training. And yet one of the great storylines of the spring training is seeing and some of the comments you've made about some of these young players that you've had a chance to see play with the big league club well it was fun watching the mondeses the bubba starlings the calice days the cuthberts all these uh young kids come up and get a chance to play and you know spring training you know it kind of works in phases uh, you know the first half of spring training our starters go out and they'll play five or six innings and you know that gives the, uh, the young guys a chance to experience a major league atmosphere even though it is in spring training but they get to hang out in the clubhouse and they get to play in big league games and each and every one of them got a lot of at bats and a lot of playing time and uh, it's fun to watch them uh, you know continue to grow and develop uh, you know you look at a kid like Mondesi who's finally starting to fill out and put on some muscle uh, is you know is very impressive first chance to get to see Caliste and you know, Bubba Starling in game-type situations every single day was fun to see and watch, you know, how they continue to get better throughout the spring uh, is fun, but uh, they're a talented group. Ned, you averaged four runs a game last year, and when that happened after the sixth inning, it was Herrera, Davis, and Holland. Can you talk about Hoach, how he's coming along? Is he going to be, is there going to be a four-headed monster up here now all of a sudden instead of the three-headed guys at the end? Nope, not all of a sudden. Um, it will be by the end of the season, I believe. But, uh, you know, Hoach is a guy right now that's only a year out of surgery. And, uh, you know, we're pitching him every fourth day. Uh, he's, his the velocity is back to 94, 95, a tremendous curveball. But, you know, we still have to get him into, uh, you know, consistent pitching shape. So you got to be careful with these guys. Generally, 
you know, it takes, you know, 14, 15, you know, months, and Hoach is only 12 months. So he's way ahead of schedule, but you don't want to jump the gun. You want to continue to, uh, you know, stay with the program. He's going to continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger uh, as, uh, you know, as the outings go by. But uh, he's not a guy that I don't think we can throw right into the mix right off the bat. Ned, I want to ask you quickly, fans wonder about this, and, and we have a shot of you right now, a wide shot, sitting outside the dugout. Explain to the fans why in spring training you will find coaching staffs on both sides sitting outside of the dugout rather than in the dugout. Because there's chairs here, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Are there any chairs in the dugout? Yeah, no. There's a bench that you got to <laughs> look over a rail, you know. But I don't know. It's just the way it's always been in spring training. I don't we well, have a little more privacy to evaluate players, don't you, outside of the dugout? Well, I don't know if you have privacy. You just get a good look at it. I mean, we're sitting right here, you know, watching Vargas pitch. We get a chance, good chance to see the hitter. We get a better chance of seeing their stuff uh, than you do during the regular season. And, um, you know, spring training, we start with 60 guys, you know, and you get, you know, 60 guys in a dugout. It gets a little crowded. So uh, it is nice to kind of come out here and, um, you know, uh, watch – you know, watch the game from out here. It's a little hot during day games, but, um, you know, it is a, it, it's a better view, I think, right now. And, uh, you know, we enjoy doing it. And uh, one last thing before we let you go. We, we finally got a chance to see uh, Omar throw on a ground ball last inning. Good to see him back out on the field. It is. It's good to see him and Gordy out there. You know, they've uh, both guys, uh, you know, have come along and both guys have... Uh, you know, done a nice job with their rehabs, and uh, I think both guys are going to be 100% ready by opening day. Well, Ned, thank you. We'll let you get back to uh, managing the game and getting ready for the uh, regular season, and we appreciate your time. You got it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, right. Ned. Yeah, I mentioned uh, Omar Infante because he is recently back to the field, and, of course, Alex Gordon, the Royals, taking that very slowly after having surgery on his right wrist. Two pros, though, Hud, who know how to get ready for a regular season in a short period of time. Absolutely. And talking with Alex before the game in the clubhouse, he, he said he's feeling really good. Uh, his, his timing, he doesn't think, is going to be a, a huge issue. However, he made sure to tell me what I already knew. But it's not how you start. It's how you finish. So, But he's healthy. He's out there. He said he feels good. His legs are, are underneath him. The only problem he's having is with these allergies. Having a hard time staying you know, healthy with his, uh, you know, head cold and everything. everything. The same thing that Bo Jackson was talking about when he was in here in the first inning. So, uh, it's all good. We got to see Infante while we were talking to Ned turn a double play, too. So, it seemed like last year he had a shoulder that was bothering him. This year it's his elbow. We're still not getting a good throw out of him, though. That's too bad because Infante has a good, strong arm. Before last season... An arm was never an issue on it with him. But watch him here. He kind of throws to the side. Escobar gives him a nice feed out over the bag. Little transfer there. You can see him grimace a little bit as he got it. That little sidearm flip is just doesn't have enough velocity to turn that double play. And I'll tell you, those double plays are huge for a pitcher in, over the course of a ball game. If he's not able to, to turn two, you know, very regular, we're going to see Cologne out there more often. I'll, 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 I'll think. I don't know. A couple of walks allowed by Vargas in the inning. And now Melky Cabrera, who flied out to left field. Oh, yeah. Now we'll get the White Sox on the board. Chicago hoping to see a lot of that as Cabrera drives in Micah Johnson. And the White Sox have runners at first and third with two down. There's no doubt about it that White Sox are, have a different outlook with a with an action player like Melky, uh, you know, solid switch hitter guy. You know, he's he's uh, well known. He's back in the league now. You can see the, the little uh, friendly embrace there. But I guarantee you, come April 6th, there won't be any hugging going on out there. But he'll he'll add a lot. And talking with Robin Ventura before the game, he said that. He's brought a lot on defense, and that's one of the things that they have to do to be able to compete with the Royals is play that kind of defense that Kansas City threw, up, threw out there this last year. So they're looking for Melky on defense as well as offense. And the industry really copies itself. I mean, we're going to see more and more teams 
like the Royals and offense is down around the game. More teams are going to put emphasis on defense. They're going to put emphasis on speed. Good pitching if they can get it. That's what got the Royals to game seven. As Vargas gives up a run. Soft speed pitches have been very good tonight. And he had Abreu reaching on the comebacker. The sport. Camelback Mountain in Scottsdale, a beautiful time to be here in the Valley as we head to the bottom of the third inning. We remind parents, don't forget to sign the kids up for Slugger's Blue Crew. Get your little ones all geared up for the upcoming season. Kids receive a performance wear t-shirt, a Royals flat bill cap, Blue Crew sunglasses, two tickets to a Royals game, a free stadium tour, and much more. And all of that for just $25. And you can sign up right now at royals.com slash blue crew. Or if you're at the ballpark, just stop by the Kauffman Stadium box office. Omar Infante will lead off. Then Alcides Escobar and Alex Gordon. We had Bo Jackson in the booth as the Royals batted in the first inning. And then Joel was visiting with Rusty Coons in the second inning. We haven't had a chance to talk about this White Sox pitcher. Carlos Radon, who has struck out five in the first two innings. He was their first round pick last year out of North Carolina State. His best pitch, they say, is a slider. And he was a teammate on Team USA one summer with Brandon Finnegan and he taught Brandon Finnegan his slider and many scouts will tell you that that was the pitch that turned Brandon Finnegan into a first round pick. Infante on with a leadoff single and that's the Royals third hit. Yeah, we would be surprised to see this kid in their rotation early in the season. I don't know if he'll make the, the, the team out of camp. There's his changeup. Do a changeup and Infante did a nice job. He stuck it. He stayed right on it. Hit it off the end of the bat. Melky Cabrera was playing him to the opposite field. And to talk about Melky's defense, he got to that ball and threw a dart into second base. Nice play to hold Infante to a single. Yeah, this kid's good. He's he's, he's got the goods. He's going to go nicely with Sale, another lefty. Up, out, out. Good fastball. Low to mid 90s. He's got a changeup. You mentioned that slider. He's also working on a cutter. So, kid's got some pretty good stuff. You know. HUD if the White Sox are thinking about putting this kid in the starting rotation at least the opening day starting rotation this is a bit of a gift to the Royals a chance to see him maybe they feel as though he will not pitch in the first three games of the season because the White Sox will be in Kansas City for those first three games so Robin Ventura he knows what he's doing but the Royals are going to see Carlos Rodon and being in the same division they're going to see a lot of him so this is a nice preview especially this time of spring and when you're playing guys in spring training teams that are in your same division they're really careful with 
what pitchers they show you. Now, Ventura's already mentioned that Samarge is going to be their opening day starter at the K on April 6th. But this kid, watch this slider. Yeah. This kid looks good. He's got a hard bite to it. You know, Darren Jackson, the White Sox radio broadcaster, talking with him before the game, he said it's a Danny Jackson type slider. And I don't know, when I heard that, I went, whoa. Because I got to see that firsthand. And it's electric. You you see it. You can't pick up the rotation. It looks like a fastball. The next thing you know, that thing darts to your back right leg as a right-handed hitter. And you're swinging over the top. It's, it's a filthy pitch. Our producer, Joe Lavero takes it a step further and says he's built like Danny Jackson. I never saw a slider like Danny Jackson's when I saw it. I'll never forget it. I was like, wow, what was that? That was the first real taste. Of it. That ball would get by. It. That was the first real taste that, that, that I had. It was in double A. I'd already played several years in A ball, but I've never seen a pitch like that before. And I'll tell you, it's a it's a real tough pitch for a right-handed hitter to lay off of. Forget about a lefty. Lefties ain't gonna touch it. Radon got Escobar with that slider and struck him out in the first inning. Ventura already has a couple lefties. Once Sale gets back in there, they got Katana. You know, they got Danks. I mean, you know, they, they got some lefties there. So I don't think they're in a hurry to rush this kid. There's another. That looked like a nice little cutter, maybe, right there. That didn't quite have the depth of the slider, but there is no doubt that Rodon is going to be in. Could have been a slider, uh, you know, cutter, but that, that that's change some speeds on it. It is it wasn't as hard as the one we showed before. Right, that's why it could have been a cutter, but that, that that broke a little bit too much for a cutter. Infante at second base, one down. Alex Gordon, the strikeout victim of Rodon, his first time up. That boy. Last pitch was 95. Scoreboard here in Surprise Stadium. Has the velocity of the radar gun. So he's got some pretty good heat on that fastball. Back with 95 again. There you go. And he mixes in that changeup and slider. The changeup will be an effective pitch for him, but that's usually, for a young pitcher like this, that's usually the last pitch to develop. But you can okay. get by with 95 and that slider. Just those two pitches. Until you can develop that other changeup. That slider stayed up. Beckham at shortstop tonight. Backs out into center field for the second out. Gordon Beckham, longtime White Sox player, was traded away to the Angels. He was with the Angels when the Royals swept them in the division series. And then as a free agent, signed back with Chicago. You mentioned Chris Sale and whether he will be available on opening day. He had a freakish accident very early in spring training. He had a very small fracture on his foot, unloading something from his truck. Well, anytime you have a series against the White Sox and you don't see that guy, that's a break. That's fastball at 96 to Lorenzo Kane. Lorenzo has one of the three hits against Rodon tonight. Royals offense really took off and really seemed to gain its identity when Ned Yost batted Lorenzo Kane third. Nori Aoki had been leading off. Aoki batted second and Alcides Escobar who's been begging to be the Royals leadoff hitter for quite some time. Ned going with the speed oriented lineup. And Ned going to 
stay with Escobar leading off Kane batting third and right now appears to use Alex Gordon in the number two position now that Aoki is with San Francisco. Eric Hosmer moved to the number four spot. He's still there. Lorenzo Kane's had a nice spring. He's impressed a lot of the coaches, especially Dale Swain. Talking with Dale during their batting practice today, he said his approach has been really good. He's staying in the middle of the field with his line shots. He's uh, hitting that low cane triangle that became popular last year. That's that little that base hit into right field. And he's a very confident hitter. So he's a different guy now. So I think, you know, he, he, he has the goods. Now, he doesn't have the prototypical power a, a three-place hitter has. But that could come. Confidence. 344 this spring coming in. It's kind of an old story now. But it was September when the Royals were in Detroit and getting kicked around by the Tigers again. And... In, in so many words in his own way, Lorenzo Cain told Victor Martinez at first base he was tired of the idle chat and tired of losing to the Tigers. And from that point on, it was a different Lorenzo Cain. He was more emotional on the field, showing his emotion after plays on defense, showing his emotion after getting big hits. He was the ALCS MVP. Oh boy. Very... For the most part, soft-spoken, mild-mannered, respectful young man. And in this game, it's almost frowned upon if you show a lot of emotion on the field. But it was a, another part of Lorenzo Cain that really seemed to bring out the best in him. And it was a welcomed emotion as well. Because, look, the rest of these uh, uh, the, the, the Royals, pretty happy-go-lucky for the most part. But when he had that scowl, and I remember our award-winning director, Steve Kurtenbach, showed... When Miguel Cabrera was trying to talk to, Al, uh, to, to Lorenzo, he didn't say a word. It was impressive. Speaking of great young pitching, when we come back, Joel Goldberg will visit with Giordano Ventura with some help from Jeremy Guthrie when we return to Surprise. Back to game six of the World Series. Oh, there's that leg kick and those seven shutout innings. And actually, we're looking at something earlier in the playoffs, but I think we were going to look at game six of the World Series, too. Hey, Albert Pools didn't get a chance to look at that one. But we are joined right now by Jordano Ventura, who did throw those seven shutout innings in the World Series. Jeremy Guthrie is here to help with a little bit of translation, too. And today, Jordano named the opening day starter. I don't know if we want to do this part in English or a little bit of help, but he says Look, we'll take a little bit of the help. What does it mean to be the opening day starter for you? Well, they have said that it's going to be the first part of the season. And what does it mean for you? I'm very happy. I'm very happy. And I'm very happy. I'm very happy. Al equipo porque me, me ha dado la oportunidad y, y eso es que me tienen confianza, entonces yo voy a trabajar duro para aprovechar el momento. 
Well, he's very excited. He says he's grateful to the team uh, for giving him this opportunity. He's going to continue to work hard and do everything he can to uh, prepare himself and have a, you know, get us started on the right, uh, the right foot this year. After pitching in the World Series, I don't know if, if it's at all nervous when you think about opening day or do you think it'll just be another game? Después de pichar en la Serie Mundial, te pone un poquito nervioso en abrir la temporada. Bueno, no, tú sabes, ya como le doy gracias a Dios porque el año pasado tu, tuve la oportunidad de, de estar en un juego grande así como ese y ya creo que tengo más o menos un poco de experiencia para pa abrir ese, un juego como ese. No, he says, you know, thanks, uh, you know, thank God that he had the opportunity last year to pitch in the World Series and pitch important games. He says that's certainly going to help him to feel more relaxed having had that experience last season. I'll ask you about him, Jeremy. You guys are in the same rotation. You've spent a lot of time in this game. He's been around not as long, but what are your impressions of Jordano and, and where he's come from, say, a year ago to now? Well, great. Just like everyone has seen, you know, he's just grown well beyond his years. You know, his experience uh, is limited, but his... Uh, the way he holds, conducts himself, the way he pitches, the way he controls, uh, what he can control out there is something that uh, you know you would expect from a seven, eight-year veteran in the major league. So he's um, he's progressed a tremendous amount in a short amount of time, and it will only get better. I know fans that are watching back at home and around the country, for that matter, they're really excited about opening day. What do you think Kauffman Stadium will be like? Bueno, tú sabes que el mundo se espera que la primer, el primer partido ahí en Kansas City, ¿qué piensas tú? Que, ¿Cómo va a ser la, el ambiente ahí en ese día? No, bueno, tú sabes, dile que nosotros vamos a trabajar fuerte y a salir al terreno a ganar como siempre lo hemos hecho y vamos a jugar fuerte para que los fanáticos estén contentos. He just says he wants to go out there and, and make them uh, make the fans happy. He knows they're going to be excited, and uh, we want to play in a way that uh, you know makes them leave the ballpark happy that day. Let's do something real quick in English here, because the English has gotten much better. Okay, much better. But how has spring training been? Uh, good, uh, good spending. You know, the second year and the spring, major league spring, and I'll be happy this year too. You know, and I name to my. First year opening day starting in the KC rotation, you know, and I'd be happy for that. And, uh, I make a, make a adjustment and I play every day. That's a big hop there to Escobar, and he jumps and grabs it, and it makes me think of a saying I hear you say all the time no chance. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you guys, though, maybe talk a little bit English or Spanish. How much fun this group has together? Well, it's a great group of guys. Uh, it's the first thing you'll notice if you get a chance to either play here or watch watch the team perform. Um, you know, everybody enjoys what they do. Uh, they, they do it with uh, excitement. They do it with a lot of an enjoyment. And so um, it makes it fun for everybody. You know, the coaches, the players, the fans, hopefully everybody enjoys the product that we bring out there every single day. And, you know, hopefully more importantly, we win games playing loose and, and playing in a way that's, uh, you know, playing like kids out there, essentially. How much fun? Uh, dile ahí que, que estamos bien contentos y que tú sabes un equipo que, que juega bien unido y siempre estamos jugando con el corazón en el terreno y le damos las gracias porque estamos bien unidos y, y el coach de, de, de picheo y todo el mundo nos ayuda mucho y vamos a echar para adelante. Es just a good group. He says we play together uh, as a unit, which makes it a lot of fun and uh, everybody works together to to have a good experience. So he really enjoys this group as well. Uh, before we wrap up, there's two outs. There's really three languages going here: English, Spanish, and HUD. Here you go, Jeremy. Uh, Jordano, yo quería preguntarte, uh, tú estás contento, bueno, que tú eres el mejor en el equipo para el, los pitchers y te lo, te lo doy las felicidades por abrir el, la temporada en casa. Shock the house. <laughs> no, no chance. No chance, Jeremy, thank you. Hey, you saw HUD in the clubhouse today. How hard were you laughing? Te ríes mucho. Yeah, wow, his hair looks redder this year, too. It's amazing. Hud's hair looks redder? Looks a little redder. Shock the house? Oh, uh, shock the hair. There we go. Jordano Ventura, the opening hey. day starter. Jeremy Guthrie. And uh, Ryan, I'll, I'll tell you this much. We think Hud's an excitable guy. You should see him on the first day that we do a game. I mean, he was just wearing everybody out in that clubhouse, and they were laughing like they had not seen their Uncle Hud in months. Goldie, I can tell you I have not had any help with the hair. It's it's all natural. And look, it, <laughs> it might looked be a little red. curlier than normal. Well, it's you know, longer. You, I, I got to.
Are you, are you're the, not, I haven't not, seen the barber. Not, you haven't gotten a perm or anything like I that, have you? I haven't seen okay. the barber lately, but, you know, we got we got a few more days, a couple weeks before opening day comes, and uh, I'll be all tightened up, but I'll tell you what. It was it was really fresh to go in there in that clubhouse, and, you know, you can tell this time of year, and, you know, I did, I did a lot of spring trainings, and these guys are a, li a little bit dragging, you know, it's kind of getting to be old hat now, but... But it was really fun to go in there and, and liven them up, and I did it on purpose. Had fun with them. Hey, fellas, what up? You know, just just to kind of give them a laugh, to kind of bring them out of their normal, uh, you know, the doldrums of spring. I could tell. And I they could, they were all they were all Ryan. They were all glued to it too. Trust me. I mean, he had everybody in stitches. So I think everybody is uh, is excited. And, and to what you know, Jordano and Jeremy were just saying too. This is a very very fun close-knit group. I think the new guys are fitting in really, really well, but also not to be lost in the shuffle, and we saw it this year or last year that, that the work ethic and the way that they take things when they need to get down to business is, is as good as there is in the game, and so and I should say, too, that you heard it just a little bit there with, with Jordano. The English is much improved. He's worked real hard on that. I tell you, depending on when you get to the ballpark, and if you go through the main entrance of the spring training building, the Royals have done an excellent job of helping the Latin players learn the language. You will see kids lined up outside of the room where they are taking English, English courses. They are watching videos. They're doing the, uh, I think they do the Rosetta Stone program. And so it's, it's no surprise to see players making big leaps when it comes to learning their second language. coming up in left field and he'll make the play to end the fourth inning. So four innings for Jason Vargas. He's given up just one run. Chicago leads one nothing. Baseball is brought to you by Steel Outdoor Power Equipment. Quality, reliability, and value. And by Menards. Save big money at Menards on all your home improvement needs. Billy Parker Field in surprise, and it still feels new. But this is the Royals' 13th year here, which is hard to believe. And this has been a very common sight. That side of the field, which is the Royals' side, the third base and left field side, has been mostly filled up. It has thinned out some in the past few days as families enjoying spring break with their kids and coming down here. But when people have asked me if I've noticed anything different, different this year, between this spring training and other spring trainings, it's been the fans. 
Ed was saying it was a madhouse over the break. People everywhere, Royals fans, exciting. You know, the backfields that they have at this beautiful complex, man, they, folks are allowed to go back there and watch the minor leaguers and watch the major leaguers take BP. He said you couldn't, it was elbow to elbow. Royals having a tough time figuring this kid out, Carlos Rodon. He has struck out seven in three innings. He got Hosmer in the first inning. Hosmer will be followed by Kendrys Morales and Alex Rios. Like you said earlier, Ryan, it's, just, it's really good for the Royals to be able to see this kid now because they're going to see him again sometime this year. I'll guarantee you, maybe several times. And even though spring training, sometimes pitchers don't always show you every pitch they have. They're getting a good sample here. Snyder's been unhittable. Wow. Not only is it tough on righties, but you can see what it does to a premier hitter like Hosmer. On the left side, man, it's tough, especially at that velocity. Ball one to Kendry's Morales. He singled leading off the second inning. One of three Royals hits tonight. All singles. One and one. He's a big, strong guy, I'll tell you. And you know, he's a, he's a presence at the plate. Loves the fastball. Has had some timing issues with other off-speed pitches this spring, but you know, pitchers have got to be able to throw a fastball to him. But the importance for Morales to be able to show some kind of plate discipline is going to be big for him in his production. Because because those those pitchers they know better. I mean, you know, he can turn a fastball around with the best of them, but he's going to have to lay off of those pitches they want him to swing out of the zone with. Good pitch there. That's a nice one. 88, that's his changeup. Beauty, good spot. Time Morales laid off the changeup. Talk about Morales and his play discipline. He's never walked more than 49 times, but he's not paid to walk. The Royals are. Open for production. He has driven in as many as 108 runs. Two years ago, he drove in 80 runs for Seattle. Oof. That is nine strikeouts in three and two thirds innings. Who knows? He may be the next coming of Cy Young. But if history repeats itself as it does over and over again for good young pitchers, and I've heard that the White Sox really want him to work on that changeup, that the league will adjust to him in ways that he's probably never been adjusted to before. No, absolutely. He'll, he, this is what the game revolves around. And when you're at this level where the best in the world perform, you're going to take your lumps, believe it. But he looks good. Teams like big, strong, power pitchers now. Talking with Dan Wilson, a great catcher for the Seattle Mariners in the backfield today where they were playing. I saw it, and we had a chance to talk with Dan. Dan talked about, HUD. everybody throws 95 now. There's no more guys that are in the league hardly starters outside of a Vargas and a Guthrie maybe that's, in, that's 88 to 90. They're all power pitchers. That's what they, they look for nowadays. They look to draft those kids. Call them horses. And a fastball out over the plate, and Rios is one for two. Short, quick bat speed here. That's nice. Yeah, that's all you got to do whenever you're facing a guy that throws mid 90s. 
Just, just let him supply the velocity. Just nice and short to the ball. Very quick, nice stroke. Ball will jump. That dude's just meet it. Watching Moustakas' his batting practice today was, was I was pleasantly surprised. He wasn't trying to see how far he could hit it here in the thin Arizona air. He was going to the opposite field with almost every stroke and every round. They usually go three, four rounds. And Moose is really working on it. Talking with George Brett, George said, you know what, he's trying to wait. He's trying to foul the ball off into the third base dugout. That's how long he's trying to wait, wait, wait. And you can do that now in spring training. Moose is tired of winning the batting title here in spring. And then struggling every year. So he's definitely making some adjustments. Which in, in year four now, he's in his fourth year, this is the time you, you, you should arrive. You should be able to make those adjustments. And become the hitter that... They projected him to become. He's dropped down some bunts in spring training. Mm -hmm. Which he's not going to do here with two outs and a runner at first base. But if he's leading off an inning when the Royals need to get something going and the defense gives it to him, he wants to be able to do that during the regular year. Here's George. One hop to Gillespie. He'll go to the bag, and that's four scoreless innings with nine strikeouts for Carlos Rodon. Hey, come out and support Greater Kansas City Day on the morning of the Royals opening day, which will be against the White Sox. Volunteers and local celebrities will sell special editions of the Kansas City Star stole, sold on street corners from 6 to 9 a.m. Also, Royals ALCS commemorative flags will be available for a $10 or more donation at a KC area hy location as proceeds will benefit the Rotary Youth Camp and other children's charities. Can you believe it? Looking at that American League Championship flag that'll be hanging at the K this year? Wow. Now, there's a lot of folks back home that, that aren't ready to turn that page from last year, Ryan. I can tell you that. But, you know, there's no need to turn it until opening day. Once opening day happens, you know, it's what have you done for me lately? That's the way this game is. But they'll have a little swagger that they developed of that hard work. Think about that. Over the last two, three, four years, the, you know, these guys have really worked hard together. Fred Austin is out number one. Let's go back down to the Royals' dugout, and here's Joel. 
Danny said, I got anything on my face? Yeah, you got like a whole beard going. Danny Duffy, who will be starting game two, second in the rotation as we get ready to begin things. And we'll talk about the beard in a minute, but how about spring training and how things are going? Oh, it's been great. You know, um, coming off, you know, what we learned last year, um, just the guys vibing in the clubhouse, it's been a lot of fun. You know, um, this has probably been the, the most different kind of camp that I've been a part of, um, you know, in, in a positive way, in a good way. We're just all really relaxed but kind of driven at the same time so it's been a lot of fun you've made a lot of changes in the offseason too i've always known you as a guy that that from 18 years old at least since we've known you that that'll go out and run forever and you changed the routine the workout routine tell me about that yeah you know i just tried to stop you know running as much as i did i mean i used to run out to the beach that's a eight to ten mile run and that was every day for me at least once so that was just more of a kind of uh kind of a mentally collect myself kind of deal wasn't even so much for like you know working out or anything I just I really do enjoy running but I kept my weight down and um, you know I definitely wanted to make a point of it to try and put on as as many pounds as I could get some good weight going and uh, you know we we accomplished that broader more strength in the legs then you're carrying around this beard too what 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 happened I just got lazy (laughs) nothing else to it man Uh, I I don't know trying to uh, trying to look a little bit older I guess the, the baby face definitely uh... oh nice play nice play uh, baby face definitely made me look about 16 so I'm trying to uh, kind of you know get a little bit older in every aspect of that I can't wait to see a pitch the first of many April 8th getting lazy I mean he hasn't found a razor in months we're back to surprise after this From one extreme to the other, 29 years in between postseason appearances to becoming the first team in Major League history to begin the postseason 8-0. And they have that to build on as the Royals are less than two weeks away from facing this team, the Chicago White Sox at Coppin Stadium on April the 6th. They've gotten a look at uh, left-hander Carlos Rodon. Who struck out nine in four innings, and now we'll see a right-hander, Chris Beck, with Eric Kratz, Omar Infante, and Alcides Escobar coming up. Lots of times when you're on the road, and I say on the road, I mean, there's, I think the longest travel in between cities here in Arizona is what, maybe 35, 45 minutes. They'll bring some kids from the minors, some guys that were maybe up in camp, but Bex is a guy that's already been sent out. He's got a nice fastball slider changeup combination.
And while he's been sent out, it is a White Sox reliever. And the White Sox had an awful time last year pitching out of the bullpen. Only the Houston Astros had a worse bullpen ERA than the Chicago White Sox. And that was one area they addressed as they made several changes. I think the two teams that made the most news were the Padres in the National League and the White Sox in the American League. White Sox signed David Robertson to be their closer. He had been with the Yankees. He already mentioned Jeff Samarja. Melky Cabrera. Adam LaRoche, who is from Fort Scott, Kansas. Four significant changes to Chicago. Trying to add some offense, add some starting pitching, and try and clean up their bullpen. And including this guy here, Emilio Bonifacio. He was a royal for a short time. And can play anywhere. So Bonifacio in center field, Beck on the mound. And Beck will get Omar Infante. Infante singled first time up. Bonifacio, he's a nice guy to have. Nice player, can play all the positions like you mentioned, Ryan. Little third, second, in the outfield spots. He's got some speed. Robin Ventura's got to be pleased with some of the additions his front office gave him. Top it short for Beckham, and he'll get Infante two down. Looks like Gordon Beckham might have more of a utility role back with the White Sox for a second stint. College shortstop made his big league debut at third base and many years at second base. They're using him at shortstop tonight. Alexei Ramirez is their regular shortstop, so Beckham getting reacquainted with that position. And here's the Royals shortstop, Alcides Escobar. He struck out twice against Carlos Rodon. Escobar, the importance of him being able to get on base is going to be extremely huge for the team. He's got to find a way to... Be a little bit more selective. Only has one walk so far in camp, and that was his first at bat or first plate appearance of the spring. But the more he can get on base, be a little bit more selective and patient, the better off he's going to be for his running game and scoring runs. Three up, three down for the Royals against Beck. Speaking of bullpens, the Royals. Bullpen, one of the best in baseball last year, and Joel will be talking with a member of that pen when we come back.
flashback to 2013. Luke Hochaver was absolutely dominant out of that bullpen. One of the longest tenured Royals. And after sitting last year with Tommy John surgery, Coach is about ready to make his return. And we are joined right now by Luke Hochaver. And, you know, Hoch, I, I said to you early in spring training, I said, I, I don't know if it's possible for anybody to be. Ooh, how about the reaction there? Great catch. Moving like a cat already. The moose moving like the cat. And you hear the moose calls. I know as a pitcher, we'll get to you in a second. He loves seeing that. I love seeing that. Heck yeah. I mean, it's a it's an every night occurrence, especially with our defense. And, you know, moose making great plays. Haas making unbelievable plays. You know, Eski, every single night he makes a web in. Omar, I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. I mean, our, our defense is phenomenal. So, I mean, that's, that's an every night occurrence. Great plays. Ted Rusty over the other shoulder, kind of staring at our monitor, going, wow. So we're used to that. It's still a lot of fun to watch. Okay. Moose so rudely with that great catch interrupted the question there, which was, I don't know if there's anybody happier to be back. How unbelievable is it after everything you've gone through to be back out here? Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, it's a, a long, boring process, you know, but, you know, thankfully we made it quite exciting there at the end last year. And, uh, you know, to have the opportunity to come back and, and, and put on a Royals uniform again. Um, you know, we were just tickled to death to have that opportunity. Where are you at now as far as your progress goes? What do you think the timeline is? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not for sure right now. You know, just kind of taking it day by day and, uh, you know, in constant communication with, with the trainers and, and with Dave and, um, you know, mapping out my throwing program and days that I'm throwing. Uh, Recently, I've gone from three days off in between to two days off in between. So uh, just working our way into uh, being able to get to back-to-back -back outings and, uh, and, and do that, you know, without any ill effects. And so, so far, it's gone, it's gone smoothly, and uh, hopefully uh, that continues. I know it was, it was kind of bittersweet last year. There's a throw to second. There's your other good buddy, Alex Gordon. There's another one. I mean, it's just... It's just constant. I love it. I absolutely love it. I'll never complain about our defense, I'll tell you that much. Well, let's turn around and we'll, we'll take a look at this replay and we'll, we'll let you tell us what you see here. This is just a, this is just a routine ball in the gap. Alex Gordon throw him out at second base. Um, I don't know who that was, but surely Abreu, he, he should know better. But, hey, test him early, find out early. You know, we'll keep him at first base the rest of the season. Or Alex will. Uh, uh, for that matter. All right, there's two outs, so I want to make sure we get to ask this. Alex is one of your best friends on the team. And the, one of your other best friends is, you got to be quick here, Mitch. And now he's a coach. I know. Every day I come in and I, I say, you know, Mitch, Mitch is taking on the coach attire. He's no more pants over the shoes. Stop watching his back pocket, lineup card in his left pocket with a wrist watch. Um, the glove on the fungo. I mean, he has taken on the coaching role. All right, we, we got to let you go. We're back after this. the regular season and Jason Vargas his numbers 
weren't going to impress anybody, but it's just early spring training, and now he's starting to crank up for the regular season and gives up just one run, three hits in six innings with just 77 pitches. Brian Lefevre, Rex Hudler back in surprise, and this is something that we've been talking about quite a bit tonight. That this is about, and even Ned Yost confirmed that, this is about the time in spring training when guys take their preparation to the next level. Exactly. Look, that line we just saw from Vargas, much better than the previous line. And Dave Island, before the game, says, you know what? But he needs to focus today. He needs to do exactly what he's done. Just one run. Well, the, the, the young left-hander for the White Sox was almost unhittable, punching out nine. Look, it couldn't score any runs for Vargas. But certainly his secondary pitches looked a lot better. I'm sure Dave Island will be happy about that. Dave Island's pitching staff last year finished fourth in the league in ERA, first in the league the year before that. Two and one to Alex Gordon. He has struck out and popped a short with Lorenzo Kane and Eric Hosmer coming up in the sixth inning. Yep, Dave Island's starting staff through the third most innings in the American League last year. He's done a fantastic job in his three years. And we'll get a chance to talk to him on Friday. Friday night's game. He's one of the best pitching coaches in the league for sure. The big jump was two years ago. The Royals three seasons ago were tenth in the league in pitching. And then under the leadership of Dave Island, first in the league in pitching, if we're talking about ERA, in 2013, and then fourth in the league last year. Good balance. Starting rotation, fifth in ERA, bullpen fourth as Alex goes the other way. And he's on to begin the sixth inning. Ned Yost before the game was telling me that Alex is right on time. You know, Alex said, ah, oh, you know, I'm a little bit off, but Ned Yost thinks his timing is really good, and you can tell here. Look at that perfect stroke. That front foot stopped his momentum from going forward. He's able to make solid contact deep in the strike zone. The ball getting close to the catcher. That's a nice opposite field knock. Alex very humble. You know, he's doesn't have a lot to say, but he's no doubt the leader of this ball club. Strike to Keen. Lorenzo not so sure. Ben May is the home plate umpire. Pretty nice sinker there. 93. And pitch just a little bit inside. We've been talking about Mitch Meyer and Rusty Kuntz is grooming Mitch Meyer to be a first base coach. Not just that, but an outfield coach, a base running coach. And Mitch has really taken on some of Rusty's mannerisms and has the routine like Rusty does in between pitches, communicating with the runner at first, looking at his stopwatch, information on the quickness of the pitcher, and relaying that to the runner. I mean, he kind of looks like Rusty a little bit, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. Well, if you're going to emulate somebody, why not Rusty Coons? It's one of the best coaches in baseball. And guys, you know, that there's such a comfort level between the two with Mitch having played for Rusty for so long. And, you know, Rusty pays so much attention to detail. We all know that. And Mitch is the same guy. So he's asking 20 to 30 questions, new questions a day. Red Sox turn to 6-4-3 double play. Mitch was as good a football player in high school 
as he was a baseball player and had an opportunity to go to the University of Michigan to play football as a walk on decided to go to Toledo instead. So very good athlete. Good defensive outfielder for the Royals smart base runner. Filled in as a pitcher a few times. Yes, he? he did. Finished last year in the Royals minor leagues at Double A Northwest Arkansas after beginning the season in the Red Sox organization. Eric Hosmer, like most Royals tonight, had a bad time with Carlos Radon, their rookie left-hand pitcher. Now getting a look at Chris Beck. Beck looks pretty good too. He's got a good, nice sinker. Low 90s. I've seen a couple of good change-ups he's thrown. Falls off of Hosmer's foot, so a foul ball. Hey, Hop. Okay. Way to play on. Hi, boy. You didn't go down. Lewis Coleman is getting ready to take the mound in the top of the seventh oh, inning. It would appear, <laughs> and Ned Gills hinted when we were visiting with him that it would appear that Luke Hochaver might be ticketed for AAA Omaha to get a little extra time so that he could pitch more times within a week as he continues to recover from Tommy John surgery. So with Coleman coming on and we might see Brian Flynn, the former Wichita State Shocker who's new to the Royals organization, it would appear that one of the last spots, if not the last spot, could come down to Coleman or Flynn, and they're both scheduled to pitch tonight. Oh, yeah. White Sox pitchers have struck out 10 in six innings, and they've held the Royals to just five hits. Vargas's night is done. Great outing for him as he fine tunes and gets ready for the start of the season. And that's really where we're at right now. And this for regular season, I think we'd probably be Herrera maybe in the seventh, Davis in the eighth, Holland in the ninth, try to get a run in there and win this ball game. And we're joined right now by the Royals pitcher of the year from last season. But let's talk about this year, Wade Davis, and how things been going in spring training as you guys look to maybe take a little step further with some of that unfinished business. Everything's been going good. I think that uh, everybody's healthy and strong. We're all starting to get uh, right where we need to be for the season to get going, and and uh, you know, ready to ready to win some games. You know, it's interesting because everybody talks about HDH and the the year that the three of you had, but you 
have Fraser for a full season. You bring back Hoat Shaver and, and other guys, maybe like, you know, Ryan Madsen or Franklin Morales, and they're guys that have closing experience. So can this bullpen be better? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that we got a lot of knowledge down there, especially the guys we brought in, bringing Hoach back, and, and Frazier's another guy who's been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, those would be guys that we can pick and, and learn some new things from and, and continue to uh, to be competitive and, and lock down games. You can see the, the atmosphere here in the dugout, and it's always, you know, a little bit laid back in spring training, but there's such a chemistry with this team. I know it's, it's the same out there for you guys in the bullpen. And that one is going to be gone off of Lewis Coleman, but how do you guys kind of walk that, I don't know if it's a fine line, but just that sort of having fun, staying loose, but then knowing when to tune, to tune it up a little bit? Uh, you know, it's important to have fun, especially in spring training. It's uh, You get some long days here in spring that you know, you're not really looking forward to, but you know, we're ready. You know, I think it's, uh, it's something we're going to have fun this year. We're, gonna, we're looking forward to opening day and, and getting these wheels turning. What did the experience do for you guys, you think, collectively as a team last year? I think growth. I think we've gotten to know each other a lot better. Me personally, you know, it's only my, this will be my third year here. I've gotten to know everybody a lot better, and, and going through that experience was a fun experience, and we all got to enjoy that together, and, and I think we want a little bit more of that. It seemed like a silly question because you had a one ERA. I mean, you had one of the historic seasons for a reliever ever in baseball, not just the Royals. So what can you work on? What do you want to improve on? Uh, preparation is something I think everybody in baseball is continually working on, and that's something that I'll be looking forward to this year. Is is certain times of the year when you're physically struggling or mentally struggling, you gotta figure new things out every year to uh, to get through those times. Well, it's, it's interesting too because you talk to some of the guys in the bullpen, and you all say the same thing about each other: the the work ethic, not just on the field, but that mental side of it, the studying and putting in the work. How much does that all rub off? on each other how much do you influence each other we influence each other a lot you know, I've, I've learned a lot from greg and and kelvin and fraser and, and host being around these guys and uh you know it's something i think every day we learn something from each other to to imply to the game and, and it's gonna help us out through the course of the year so who's the guy that keeps everyone loose in the bullpen you guys are i don't know that you guys have that one like classic bullpen clown uh I don't know, Kelvin, maybe Frazier. I think it's a combination of everybody. I think uh, just about every day we're going to have a good time down there and, and get some laughs in before the game gets going. Yeah, well, opening day will be here for, before you know it. Have you thought at all what that atmosphere will be like? I mean, you're, you're coming off the last time you were at Kauffman Stadium as electric as it can be, but now opening day and there will be a little bit of celebration obviously going on. Yeah, it'll be fun. I think I've thought about the atmosphere a couple of times. I know it's going to be uh, – fans will be ready. I think our, our team will be ready. I know we got – we got some uh, some payback to get going in the World Series and hope we get back there and, and win it. Wade, thanks for the time, and we're looking forward to seeing you out there. HDH and more. The other guys, too, wrapping up some of these games again this season. Thank you. Wade Davis, what a great year he had, but he was very quick, wanted to point out, hey, guys, let's, let's focus now on 2015. A lot of work to be done. Well, he's very humble, very modest, and yet you're talking about one of the best single performances by a relief pitcher in Major League history. He went 72 innings with that one ERA. That's the fifth lowest ERA in Major League history with at least 72 innings. Fifth lowest ever. <laughs> That's amazing. As long as this game's been played. Lewis is telling Kratz right now, look, that was my ball. Sorry about that. Check out Wade Davis. Waiter, check please. Hope we hear more of that and see more of that. This guy right here, Brian, fifth best ever? Was 72 innings or more. Beckham out on the fly ball to left field. One down in the seventh inning. But those guys, those three guys, HDH, Royals fans started calling them that fantastic back into that bullpen. They combined for a 1.28 ERA and allowed only three home runs in 204 and a third innings. Really? That's unheard of. Is it possible?
that they can repeat that? I don't know. There's a lot of people out there wondering if the Royals can repeat the success they had last year, too. Because they're thinking, and they came out of nowhere. They're not going to do it again. But we'll wait and see. Carlos Sanchez has a one out single. Well, they might not be able to repeat those exact numbers. I don't think the overall bullpen is going to lose much effectiveness. Lewis Coleman has given up a couple of hits and a run in this inning. He's had a good spring. The Royals have been very happy with the way he has thrown the ball in Arizona. These are his numbers from last year, which were quite a departure from the year before. In 2013, his ERA was 0.61. And that spiked to 5.56. And then you remember a year ago, he injured a fingertip on his right hand. Now, just about any other player in any other sport, an injured fingertip, you think, well, big deal. You know, rub some dirt on it, spit on it, put a band aid on it, whatever. But a pitcher and somebody who throws with such a unique motion like Lewis Coleman does, I mean, He's not going to be as effective if his fingertips aren't right. That hurt him. Set him back. But you know, they, they love how the ball's coming out of his hand this spring. Dave Island said he's got a lot more action on his two-seam fastball. He's getting more movement into righties and away from lefties. He's elevating his four-seam fastball. Not there. That's the middle of the plate. Rios makes a play in the corner and Sanchez tags and moves up to second base. It would be like asking somebody to thread a needle with a broken finger fractured fingertip. The pressure point point on that finger is really severe for a pitcher even for an infielder outfielders not as much but infielders have to handle that ball and transfer it you know that pressure there you know even if you bite your fingernails down low or you clip them too low too tight uh, you know that that type of feel and most everybody knows what that feels like that even can cause some problems with it with the location and direction well we saw for years when Jeremy Offelt was with the Royals and a promising left hand pitcher the Royals had big plans for him to be a starter he ended up being a, an effective reliever and now he's won three World Series with San Francisco but he had an ingrown nail on his left index finger that the Royals could just not figure out Jeremy couldn't figure out it was causing blisters it would tear the skin and for a while it looked like it was going to affect his entire career so here's a grown man a big man like Jeremy Offelt being affected by a, an ingrown fingernail. But, you know, for a pitcher, that is no small injury. Infante has been busy tonight compared to a couple of days ago when he played the field for the first time. Throws out Micah Johnson. The White Sox get a run off of Coleman in the seventh inning.
Seventh inning, 2 nothing Chicago. Live Royals baseball is back in 2015 with MLB.com at bat on your smartphone or tablet. Stay connected with the Royals from spring training and all season and into the postseason wherever you are with live radio broadcasts, statistics, breaking news, and much more. Download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball. Mer Morales, Rios, and Moustakas coming up in the bottom of the seventh inning facing Chris Beck. This is Beck's third inning. Morales is one for two with a second inning single. One ball, one strike. Two and one. When I mentioned how Morales lost a lot of playing time last year. There was no spring training for him. He's not going to let that happen this year. He has far and away the most at-bats of any Royal. He has 54 with two at-bats tonight. No other Royal has 40 at-bats. So he is doing the best he can to make up for that lost time. 288 average coming into tonight's game. It's not bad. Into the shift. Bobbled. And Morales will be safe. Well, that second baseman might be feeling a little added pressure as he's out in shallow right field. And with more on that, let's go down to Joel. And I'm not sure if the Royals third base coach liked that play or not. This is his team, so I think Mike Gershley will be okay with that. But that is his son, Justin. So a very proud father out there in Mike Gershley. Before the game, Justin, who's an extra, was going to come in as a replacement later in this game. Well, they orchestrated this one and had Justin out there to bring out the lineup card and meet his father. Mike Gershley is usually the one almost always to bring out the lineup card for Ned Yost, father, son. This one was supposed to be a surprise. I think Gersh would have been surprised. But the cat got let out a little bit out of the bag because I think the White Sox hitting coach came over and innocently said hey Jersh your son's coming out so that kind of messed up that surprise but still a pretty neat moment I know that Mike's wife Sherry and Justin's mom is also here in the stand so pretty great moment for the Jershley family and by the way you want to talk about a small town being into the playoffs this is Packer country up in Clintonville Wisconsin but they said all the shops and everything up there in Clintonville were decorated in blue throughout the playoffs in the World Series and that man answered a few questions about a certain play over and over again but we all agree that uh, he only had one choice and he made the right one. You have any thoughts on that play? Yeah, he did the right thing. Yeah. No question about it. Imagine how many times that play would be rerun over and over in the history of the rest of baseball had he ran Alex into the last out in game seven of the World Series. They would replay that forever. Mm -hmm. Jersh would have had to have a police escort out of the ballpark. I mean, it would have been unbelievable. People would have been irate. How could he do that? So if you think about it that way, I mean, you know, look, he did the right thing because, you know, they want to win the game. They had one out to go, and they had Salvi coming up. They, they still had, we still had a chance. That's Rio's second hit. Ryan Jackson, who's running for Morales, stops at second base. Two on, nobody out. I think it was just an emotional reaction because I'll just speak for myself. Madison Bumgarner being available or not, I could not imagine any scenario when I went to Kauffman Stadium for Game 7 of the World Series where the Royals were not going to win that game. I mean, they're coming off a 10-0 win. I thought by the time Bruce Bochy got to Madison Bumgarner, yeah. the Royals would be leading 7-1. And when Pablo Sandoval fell on his back after catching the pop-up in foul ground and the Giants started throwing their gloves in the air, it was like something had been stolen from the Royals and their fans.
because I think we all figured it was over. I mean, they were going to win this game. And then it's just human nature to figure, okay, who do we blame now? What went wrong? What did not go according to plan? And I think for most, and they've done scientific studies and um, trying to judge the, you know, the distance Alex had to run and the throw yeah, that didn't they Brandon have, Crawford. Had. Didn't they have one of the college teams reenacted? They did. It was Rockhurst that did that. Mike Moustakis, we've been talking about him going the other way. He didn't quite get all of it. But that's the swing the Royals want to see is teams will be testing him all year to see if he can drive the ball to the opposite field. And that was well hit, albeit out. Let's take a look at Moose. Slightly open. That ball's on the outer half and up and elevated. That's exactly what he wanted. A drastic change from last year. Remember how Moose's right foot was way out of the batter's box? And he was he was experimenting on that thing, and, and it just wasn't working. But hopefully now he's figured out a few things, and he'll be able to go that way more often. I think the Royals would be thrilled if Moose could have the season like he had in 2012. 614 plate appearances, a 242 average, 34 doubles, 20 homers, and 73 ribbons. They would take that. And so would he. No question. on Eric Kratz. Kratz can give him the lead with one swing. He's got a couple homers this spring. That boy. One ball, two strikes. When and how often will Eric Kratz be used this year? That's one of the big questions going into the season as the Royals want to and have to find a way to get Salvador Perez off of his legs more often this year than last year. Two and two. Well, you know, he, he's a fine receiver for such a big guy. He does a good job. He gets down, presents a nice target to the pitchers, and he's got some pop with that bat. We saw that multi home run game he had, and one of those homers was with a broken bat. I mean, busted his bat almost in half. Strong. Kept it on the outer half. Great location. Second strikeout for Beck and the 11 strikeout for two White Sox pitchers tonight. Omar Infante has singled and grounded out to short. He has Jackson at second and Dyson at first. <laughs> Omar Infante last year, and we mentioned spring training a year ago he had a sore shoulder he had a sore elbow and then remember very early in the season he was hit in the face by Heath Bell and did not suffer a serious injury as a result of that he was on the disabled list with a lower back problem and then had the shoulder problems toward the end of the year and into the postseason and it was 
overall, it's interesting, his number is really a mixed bag. I think overall it was an unproductive season for Omar Infante, but he did end up with a career high in RBIs. Sliced up the right field line and foul. Hey, Angel Beltray now in right field in pursuit. Two balls, one strike. Jackson running for Morales and Dyson running for Rios. Coming up, and Beltre over from right field makes a play. So Royals had two on, nobody out, but Beck pitches a scoreless seventh inning, and Chicago leads 2 0. And look at this over and over again. I think we all remember that one in Anaheim, the home run swing of Eric Hosmer. He was fired up, so was Salvi. And what a memorable, memorable 2014. We're joined right now by the Gold Glover, the Royals' first baseman, and emerging leader Eric Hosmer. I know you look at that stuff, it's got to be a lot of fun at the same time. You guys are getting close to the real deal here now, too. How, how fired up are you about getting this thing going? Yeah, it's getting close. You know, we're, uh, we're starting to play more night games now, and it's uh, about a week away from, from getting out of surprise and, you know, starting to play with that third deck. So what has it been like here? As far as, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, how, how much more loose are they or how much more fun are they having? Well, you guys have always had fun. I, I, I've always seen that in spring training from you, but just from the experience of last year, how different is the team? Uh, it's a lot different. You know, we, we know what we got to get done. We know what we got to accomplish every day. So we're coming in, knowing the work we got to get done, and, you know, when it's time to work, we're getting after it. But, you know, we're not working. We're having a great time, and, and it's a blast being out here with all these guys. But, uh, you know, the main focus is, is when we're getting our work in and what, whenever we're doing whatever we're doing as a team, we're, you know, we're locking in for that uh, whatever drill it is that day. See the leadoff triple there from former Royal Emilio Bonifacio. His brother was in camp for a while, too. Looks like. He looks like a Bonifacio is what he looks like, a uh, Jorge. But I want to ask you about leadership. James Shields has gone, did so much for it. But you've been, you know, you haven't been shy about saying, hey, you'll, you'll pick up some of the slack here, too. How comfortable are you in that role? Uh, very comfortable. I think a lot of us, especially after last year, are, are real comfortable in taking that role on. It's, uh, 
you know, it's quite a journey to get to the postseason and uh, to make it to the World Series like we did. So, you know, just being a leader is, uh, is, is when those guys come up, the guys that haven't been through that experience yet, just kind of give them a heads up on what they're about to experience. And then now that we've been through that, we can do a better job of helping the young guys come up. And, you know, that's why a lot of us are, are ready to take that role on. Curious, as you're, you're out there tonight and you get a look at a young, obviously emerging pitcher, on the other side that you may not see right out of the gate, but got to figure you'll see him pretty soon. So how much are you trying to get a book on a guy that you know you're going to be seeing for a lot of years? Yeah, well, that's, you know, the benefits of being down here in spring is, uh, you know, you, you can afford to take pitches. You can afford to see as many pitches as you can, and that doesn't take away from the stuff that he had that uh, he was throwing tonight. You know, he's a, he's a great pitcher. He's, he's a guy we're going to face for many, many years throughout the division. But I think, uh, you know, the results were obviously weren't that good tonight for us, but we really got a lot accomplished, and we got a lot done tonight because a lot of guys got deep in accounts and, and really got to see a lot of his pitches. I've been asking the guys how much you've been thinking about what that atmosphere will be like at Kauffman Stadium on opening day. I don't know if anything can top the World Series, but fans have been chomping at the bit since basically November. Yeah, we're excited to get back. We're excited to play in front of the home crowd. We, uh, you know, we feel if we come back and get off to a hot start, we're going pick to right, pick off right where we left off last year, and we know everyone's excited, and, and we're equally as excited to get back and play at the K. All right, well, well, we'll let you go on that. No, though, I should say, and, you, know, you always have a pretty good facial hair thing going. I can't, I'm not even going to try to compete with that, but, but Duffy, I mean, but, you, know, you guys all kind of came up together around the same time. What do you think of the mountain man? I love it. Duffy's had, Duffy has the, the ability to pull off multiple looks. I can only go the scruff and a little bit on the, the facial hair side, but you know, Duffy can come through with something different, and he pulls it off every year. That'll be your starter for the second game opening day, April 6th, with Jordano Ventura taking the hill. It's going to be rocking. Can't wait to see you at Kauffman Stadium and everybody there, and good luck just finishing things out strong the rest of spring training. Appreciate it, Jordan. All right, Eric Hosmer and company getting down to business. And, and let's point this out, too. We've said it over and over again. They keep things awfully loose, too. His good buddy, Gerard Dyson, takes care of that. And his good buddy is out in right field as Ned Yost made wholesale changes. Changes at every position, including Franklin Morales. There's Dyson. He's playing in right field as Paulo Orlando is in center. Usually during the regular season when Dyson will come in, he will play center and Kane will move to right. And now we'll see how fast Dyson is and how far he will go. It'll bounce over the wall for a double and an RBI for J.B. Shuck as he drives in Bonifacio. So Franklin Morales has allowed a triple, a double, and the White Sox still with nobody out. Well, obviously, that pitch is not where Morales wanted it. That ball was up and in and allowed Shuck to get the barrel on it in this thin Arizona air. But the wind's also helping him, blowing out tonight. But, you know, look, Morales, he's a, a veteran lefty. He'll make this squad. They got to have him. I like his deception with his delivery. He's got a nice little cross turn to his, to his body. Uh, he hides the ball well. You know, low 90s. He can't touch the mid 90s. He's got a nice slider. But he does not locate in this inning here. He is 29 years old. Franklin Morales used mostly as a starter by the Rockies last year. The year before that, he was used mostly as a reliever by the Red Sox. Two balls, one strike. Let's take a look at Morales. Check him out. See that, that front leading foot hit comes way up. He's got nice separation over the rubber, over the top. He's got a little swing, but he has a, a, a nice hip turn. It was hard to see from that angle, but he's, he almost turns his back to the hitter, and that presents issues to righties and lefties. Now, that's a little bit of a herky-jerky type motion that can be deceptive. That's a nice breaking ball there. You wouldn't called a strike but that's a, that's a good pitch he also features a good cutter Dave Island was talking about 
the big curve and you know being more of a situational lefty but Ned has also said that they don't really need a situational lefty with back into that bullpen with Herrera Davis with Holland and those guys are capable of getting righties and lefties it doesn't matter who's hit Good spot. So a triple, a double, and now a walk. The Morales certainly doesn't want to be walking these hitters as Robin Ventura has also made changes. And any major league pitcher at this point in spring training wants to throw strikes, but you especially want to throw strikes to hitters whose numbers are higher than 90 and they don't have their names on the back of the jerseys. That's right. But remember, those are the hungriest guys out there. They're looking to do something. They want to go, you know, they want to make an impression. Spring's getting late. These guys get called up for the for these at bats here late in games, man. They they know that at the, this level, there's scouts here that they're, they're being watched. They're auditioning for other teams as well. So those guys are really looking to swing that bat. Like I was down in the minor league complex today watching Chris Young pitch to uh, Seattle minor leaguers. And those guys were hungry. They they got some hits off of Young. Got to be careful. He's pitching to those, uh, those young players that have big numbers. This is Keon Barnum. One of those minor league call-ups. Mm -hmm. Took over at first base for Connor Gillespie. All right, Keith. Big kid. Yeah. <laughs> Batting with Shuck at second base and Soto at first. Camp, the minor leaguers called up, and Keon Barnum has hit a three run home run, and the White Sox have hit a triple double, and then after a walk, a home run off of Franklin Morales. Keon, man, he got every bit of this. Morales, again, same location. Is that. Pitch to Shuck, up and in, elevated. That ball's going to get hit. Like I said he, he, he's he's a large individual. That guy. He, he showed some bat speed there. Take that back to the minors with you. There's a little more turn. Morales is delivering. Merrifield, Whit Merrifield will make the tag on Beltre for the first out of the inning. I don't think that ball was wounded. That was not an Arizona home run. No. <laughs> That's not anywhere. Gordon Beckham is 0 for 3. Over the outside, strike one. at one time was considered the Colorado Rockies number one pitching prospect and in that ballpark at that altitude they are always looking for pitching 
And in those days as a minor leaguer would be considered by most scouts more of a thrower than a pitcher. Good velocity didn't always find the strike zone and had quite a few arm troubles very early in his big league career. On the disabled list in 09, 2010, 2012, 2013. He was injury free last year and made 38 appearances for the Rockies and 22 of those were starts. That pitch looked like it surprised Beckham and Royals catcher J.C. Boskin. A lot better spot there. That's where he wants to stay. Keep that ball down there the, around the knees, but it's going to be effective during the regular season, you hope. Breaking ball a little bit outside. Three balls and no strikes. This is Trey Michaleski. Took over at third base for Sanchez last half inning. That ball's hard hit. Off of Dyson's glove, and Michael Leski will end up at second base. We'll see how they score it. Most likely be a double. That wasn't an easy play. Either way, that is the fourth hit for the White Sox off of Morales in this four run eighth inning. Nice uh, short swing there. Dyson trying to cut it off, thinking it's going to take a skip, and he just kind of pulled up his glove a little bit. Thought he might. Take a skip to the wall, showing off his good arm. I'll tell you, talking with Gerard Dyson in the clubhouse today, he's really changed. He's different. He he has a more calmer demeanor about it. He's more confident. Amazing what that success can have on a player in these in these, these guys. He's actually becoming a leader. I was down on the minor league fields talking with Bubba Starling. This morning, and I said, Bubba, what was your first taste of big league life like? And he said that it was a valuable experience for me. He was able to see how professional that these players were, how they went about their job. And I said, well, who who helped you the most? He mentioned Lorenzo Kane and Gerard Dyson. He also said Moose that was a, has been a big influence for him. But he talked about how those guys, you know, they worked with him. They, they tried to talk about how... You know, we gotta, you, you gotta stay loose. You gotta stay relaxed because there's, there's so much pressure at game time between the lines for three hours that you know you, when we come into clubhouse here, it's downtime. You know, you gotta be, be able to have fun and relax. You know, of course you have fun when you win, but Bubba needed to hear some of that stuff. Bubba Starling also said that Dale Swain helped him offensively with his bat. And we all know that's one of the reasons that he's been, been toiling in the minors for so long right now. I mean, not so long, but it was a few, three years. And Dale taught him to keep it simple. Try to find that release point. Bubba, Bubba Starling was saying, I never even knew to look at the pitcher's release point. I always was looking at the, at the whole body of the pitcher, you know, and just trying to pick up the ball. But... He focused on that release point. That's what Dale told him. He said he was impressed with Swain's hitting philosophy by keeping everything simple. That's a long inning for Franklin Morales as the White Sox score four runs.
White Sox with five of their six runs in the last two innings and lead six nothing to the bottom of the eighth inning. Tonight's copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Kansas City Royals and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the expressed written consent of the Kansas City Royals Baseball Corporation. Ryan Lefever with Rex Hudler and Joel Goldberg, along with producer Joel Libero, director Steve Kurtenbach. Surprise Arizona. And here is Scott Carroll, former Liberty High School star, both baseball and football, and he did the same thing at Missouri State. Made his big league debut with the Chicago White Sox last year in April at 29 years old after eight seasons in the minor leagues. I love his story. And then his win came against David Price, a pretty good left hand. He outpitched him. That's wonderful. You know, you'll never experience greatness or get to the highest level of what you want to achieve if you quit. He stayed at it. I love the perseverance there. That's what you got to do sometimes. I mean, even an athlete like this guy, you know, as good as he is, it's tough because everyone was a was a three sports star that's up here. They're all great athletes. You know, Bubba Starling brought him up earlier. That guy, what an athlete he is. It just takes time for some guys. You can't quit. You got to give it a chance. If you don't give it a chance, you never get there. Interesting this morning at the complex at 8 o'clock in the morning. I got in here So I know in, here in the minor league complex everything happens early Kurt Warner Super Bowl champ former MVP with the st. Louis Rams was talking and motivating the minor league Complex all the players all the young minor leaguers were all dressed in their their uniforms And they were all sitting there and Kurt Warner was telling them the same thing about perseverance about not quitting about you know look if, if he would have quit when he was playing arena football or having to play overseas he would have never become an MVP or a Super Bowl champ you gotta believe in yourself and he talked a lot about failure how to deal with that how to learn from your mistakes and not be afraid to fail wonderful lessons that Dayton Moore does with his organization to instill confidence in these young players by bringing people in Every spring. You need some encouragement. It's a hard game up here. Yeah, that's a nice little sinker. This is Moises Sierra in camp with the Royals as a non roster player and played with the White Sox last year. In Scott Carroll's case, he had to persevere through some injuries. He had surgery on his right hip. He had Tommy John surgery. 138 minor league games over eight seasons before getting to the big leagues. Ooh. As Kataris took a little bell ringer with the back swing. Looking for the first out. Now, Paulo Orlando, who came to the Royals from the Chicago White Sox. Paulo Orlando from Sao Paulo, Brazil. got him in a trade with the White Sox back in 2008 in exchange for left-hander Horacio Ramirez who's been in the Royals organization since 2008 let's go down to Joel I was talking to Paulo today we have known him for a while and you know, if he can make the big leagues and he's knocking on the door he'd be the third player from Brazil to do that trivia question 
you, you know it. I mean, they were both in the division, although one is gone now. Andre Rienzo with the Marlins now, and of course, Jan Gomes, and those are two friends of his. He's a prospect up in Toronto, too, but you know, he was telling me, and this is a guy that started playing baseball around 11 years old. He would go to this club on the weekends and work on fundamentals like catching fly balls, but he was a track star running the 100, the 200, the 400 later, was in the World Junior Championships in Italy at the age of 18 for Brazil. And a nice looking swing there for Paulo, so good to see with that. But he said that the other day when Ned Yost mentioned that they may actually take seven relievers instead of eight and an extra outfielder, suddenly a, the buzz grew back in Brazil, and he was showing me a bunch of blogs and articles. And I, I wrote down the headline here, and I know you guys are awfully good in Portuguese, but it said... I took Portuguese in college. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, here we go. M. Alta, Paulo, Orlando, Tem Grandes, Chances de Abrir... A temperado com os Royals. Basically that, that's, saying, what? Joel, that's not Brazil. That's not uh, Portuguese, buddy. That's Get uh, Guthrie over there. Yeah. I don't know Guthrie what that was. Speak, uh, Portuguese. He speaks Spanish, but uh, basically, what he was saying was a high chance of him opening the year with the Royals, and so there is a, a great amount of buzz going on right now, and I could sense just a lot of pride from Paulo and being so close, and hopefully being that third Brazilian ever to play in the uh, in the big leagues. Three languages, Portuguese or whatever that was I just read, yeah. Spanish the, and English. The next blog, Joel, the next headline of the next blog is going to be Kansas City <laughs> Royals announcer attempts yeah. to translate Portuguese headline. Well, or, or how about read it? Or read it, yeah. Yeah, the translation was good. The reading, we all knew where that would go. Yeah. Rhino, I, how's your Portuguese? It's, uh, well, I, I tell you what, the day I walked out of that class, I forgot all of my Portuguese. But I took two years of Portuguese. Well, I'm not making that up. Wow. No, I thought you were at first, but I think you and... Bon you dia. And, you and uh, Paulo should start hanging no, out. No, we really shouldn't. Okay. There was, uh, in college, as a liberal arts major, you're given the option of taking... You have to take a language. If you take one of the, the original romance languages, then you had to take three years of it. Wow. But then there were some secondary languages that you only had to take two years. And having taken Latin in high school, I thought I would take Portuguese. Figuring, I guess, I would spend a lot of time in either Portugal or Brazil. And um, I think I like my money back for those classes that I took. So you just you wanted you wanted the two year plan, not the three. Exactly. It was it was purely based on how many years I'd have to take a language. But weren't you scholarship? Yes. So the school paid for. So I guess the, the school wants its money back. Rex, how many languages for you other than uh, English kind of He's and He's still hug? working on his first, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I know. You know what? Yeah. Don't kid yourself. I, I played in three countries. I'm learning the English language. It might be the most difficult. However, <laughs> in French, I, I got a little bit of a French in me, and I got some Japanese in me. Believe it. Well... Regardless of the poor Portuguese, what a, what a neat story mm -hmm. to see this kid growing up. And, you know, so many people play soccer. And, and he's proud of, you know, Brazil and suffered when they lost in the World Cup. But, but he wasn't a soccer kid. He was a track star and then baseball. I'll tell you what is uh, Whit Merrifield is down on strikes. In all seriousness, he has played a very graceful center field. You can see why the Royals have been very patient with him. Joel, you mentioned being a track star. He runs well. He's big. He's not He's not what you would expect a center fielder to be. He's tall. He's put together. Very graceful in center field. Good speed. And right on the edge of getting to the big leagues for the first time. He's built a little bit like Rios. Yes. Built like Rios, and, and you know, there's some similarities, I think, too. But but the size, the height wise, definitely like Rios. Maybe you know, we see Lane Adams coming up, he's another bigger guy um, that you, you see, and, and Bubba Starling, too. Let me tell you what, guys with that type of, of body structure make better baseball players, and I'm going to tell you why because the, the, the length in your, in your legs and arms, when you get extended on a baseball and you hit one like that, you can get more leverage. Good glide, Ben. Scoreless inning for Scott Carroll. 6 nothing Chicago at the end of 8.
Billy Parker Field in Surprise Arizona. After tonight, 11 more exhibition games to go before opening day. The Royals will play nine of those here. A couple of games in Houston. And then back to Kansas City where they will play the White Sox for three and then hit the road for the first time. This is Brian Flynn. He is an Oklahoma native. He played his college ball at Wichita State where he was drafted by the Tigers. Traded to the Marlins in a deal that involved his teammate now Omar Infante and then coming over to the Royals in an offseason trade for Aaron Crow. Ooh. How about that action? Dave Island talked about the angle. You know, when you're that tall, he's got a good downhill angle. That, that that's really makes it more difficult for hitters to square that up. Not that bad. Run into pieces. He's got a nice angle on his fastball. He's got a slider. And an occasional changeup. They like him. And he's big, 6'7", 250. He has made 98 professional appearances, minor leagues and major leagues, and only one relief appearance. And the Royals figured he would be a starter when they traded for him, but the way he's pitched in spring training, there is some thought about him making the club as a reliever. He's a, he's a big guy. Low 90s. That is Justin Gershley, the son of Royals third base coach Mike Gershley. He's out on a 3-1 ground out. Flynn's a good athlete, too. He got over to first base with no problem. <laughs> got to get over. Look at that little spin move. Look at him take that angle. You want to head up the line. See how he goes straight towards right field? That's important. So the runner, you stay out of the runner's way, and you can touch the inside part of the bag. Fundamentally sound. They work on that religiously every single day. PFP, pitchers fielding practice. Strike to Emilio Bonifacio. He tripled and scored in the eighth inning. The speedy Bonifacio, two down. Nice play by Roberts. Got a chance to talk with, with Roberts a little bit today. This 34-year-old guy who's, you know, looking for an opportunity. He said that he's he, he didn't come to camp really expecting to to I don't know, bond with the players and fit right in. He he knew that he's kind of bounced around from team to team over the last few years. But what has happened, he told me, that is that the Royals players are, are, are really fun. It's easy to be in that clubhouse. Players make you feel comfortable. And now he said, I don't want to go anywhere else. I want to stay here. That's from somebody who's coming from an, a different organization. We're talking about the camaraderie they have inside that clubhouse is really special. Reason why the Royals were able to get Alex Rios. Rios had multi year contracts on the table when he took a one year deal with the Royals because, like a, like a lot of fans, Major League players were watching the playoffs and watching this team advancing and having a great time doing so. And Rios, who has never been to the postseason, wanted to be a part of it. Ryan Flynn didn't hurt his chances of making the club with that inning. Three up, three down with a strikeout to the bottom of the ninth inning. The Royals are down.
It's been an excellent pitching night for the Chicago White Sox. They have pitched eight scoreless innings. They have walked one and struck out 13. This is Arsenio Leon. He'll get the bottom of the ninth inning. So the Royals have Gerard Dyson, Ryan Roberts, and J.C. Boskin coming up. Most impressive tonight for Chicago among their pitchers, Carlos Rodon, who pitched four scoreless innings with nine strikeouts. And as Eric Hosmer shared with us when he was chatting with Joel, that taking nothing away from Rodon's efforts tonight, that in a spring training game and knowing that they're going to face him quite a bit, that maybe Royals weren't as aggressive as they might be in the regular season. An opportunity to see the ball come out of his hands, see what his pitches look like, and as a result, a lot of counts that started 0 1, 1 2. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's talking about seeing pitches in spring training. Who's going who's, who's gonna to worry about him taking a call third strike in spring training th two, three, four weeks from now? When you might see this kid again because you want to see pitches. That's all right. Take some pitches. Look at it. The stats here in spring training are not on the back of your bubblegum card. Gerard Dyson came on as a pinch runner for Alex Rios in the seventh inning. This is his first at bat tonight. One ball, two strikes. Getting back to Gerard Dyson. I asked Ned. Ned, since Rios is a little bit better defensively in right field than Nori was, will you be using Dyson like you did last year? And he said yes. And I was surprised by that. But he said Dyson makes our outfield better. That was a very typical late inning defensive change. Dyson into center field and Lorenzo Kane would shift over to right. But Ned said that he didn't want to mess with Lorenzo Kane, that Dyson would be playing more right field than center. He don't want to be moving Lorenzo to right field. Like he did last year. No chance at third for. Mikelski and he boots it. It's an air and Roberts is on with one out. This is J.C. Boskin, who has been a professional since 1997. He has had a little bit of Major League time, one game in 2010, four in 2011, six in 2012, and six in 2013. Spent a lot of time in the Atlanta Braves organization. In fact, from 97 through 2012, he was mostly in the Braves organization. He has played for the Gulf Coast Braves. He's been in Danville, Macon, Macon another time, Myrtle Beach, back to Gulf Coast, Macon, Myrtle Beach, Greenville, Richmond, Myrtle Beach, Richmond, Greenville, Greenville, Richmond, back to Richmond, Huntsville, Nashville, Louisville, Chattanooga, Mississippi, Gwinnett, Mississippi, Gwinnett, little time with Atlanta, Gwinnett, Atlanta, Gwinnett, Atlanta, Iowa, Chicago, Chattanooga. Uncle. I think he's got a few stickers on his traveling Unbelievable. trunk. Unbelievable. Talk about a guy hanging in there. And he just got him a knock. Royals trying to take that goose egg off the board. 
Have they been shut out this spring yet? The Royals? I haven't seen. I've been following them. I've seen where they... Angel Franco is going to run for J.C. Boskin. And now Christian Colon will get in at bat. Christian Colon made his big league debut for the Royals on July the 1st at Minnesota. And the White Sox will turn a double play to put an end to this game. The Chicago White Sox behind excellent pitching shut out the Royals tonight allowing just eight hits and walking only one with 13 strikeouts. So the Royals dropped to 13 and 9 in spring training games. The White Sox are now 8, 11, and 3. Final score is 6 0. And we will wrap things up from surprise right after this.